This is the Georgia Farm Monitor. Since 1966, your source for state and national agribusiness news and features for farmers and consumers about Georgia's number one industry, agriculture. The Farm Monitor is produced by the state's largest general farm organization, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now, here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Burgamy. Well, let's hope the old saying is true. April showers bring May flowers and yes. later on, cotton, peanuts, and other great Georgia crops. Hi again, folks. Welcome to the Georgia Farm Monitor. I'm Ray D'Alessio. And I'm Kenny Bergamy. Once again, we've got a full slate of stories for you. Straight ahead on the program, Congress sends a strong message to EPA that they are not the least bit happy about the proposed Waters of the U.S. rule. But is the agency listening? Also on the show, if your landscape property is being overrun by daylilies, help is on the way, courtesy of the Georgia gardener, Walter Reeves. And then later, now that he's back on the farm full time, what was it like serving as the American Farm Bureau's National Young Farmers and Ranchers Committee Chair? We'll hear from Jake Carter on the lessons he learned and why he says it was good to step out of his comfort zone. These stories and much, much more starting right now on the Georgia Farm Monitor. Well, to start things off with a new farm bill comes a number of new questions and concerns for farmers around the country. In part two of his conversation with USDA Deputy Secretary Krista Hardin, the Monitor's Damon Jones reports on some of the potential changes farmers and ranchers can expect, not only on the farm, but also in Washington. After years of hard work and negotiations, the new farm bill was finally passed early last year, easing some of the concerns farmers had about the future. However, since its inception, commodity prices have drastically fallen, meaning it's likely to cost the government more than originally anticipated. It's a situation USDA Deputy Secretary Krista Hardin knew was a possibility. You know, the thing is farm bills are written um, for the time that you know about. And it's a time certain. And you can make projections, you can look out, but a lot of things change. And so you don't always know. So clearly the farm bill is going to cost more than the predictions when it was being written. I think that's understandable. What happens in markets, what happens um, around the world does impact agriculture so directly. With that higher cost, producers are of course concerned about more cuts to the new farm bill. And while legislation is looking into the issue, Hardin says they are dedicated to doing what's right by the farmers. I think there is a commitment from our country to help farmers um, to make sure they stay on the land and they keep that safe and abundant food supply that we all have grown very accustomed to. Um, so um, reconciliation is something that Congress is going to have to look at. They are going to look at all issues. One of the main reasons for optimism is all the ag groups to spend time letting lawmakers know just how important these insurance programs are, not just to the farmers, but the country as a whole. We will see what Congress does, but I am proud of our organizations who are really trying to tell that story and making sure that it's understood what is happening in the marketplace and how the safety net is still needed. And I think um, it only takes one disaster, one real disaster, and a farmer or a ranger is, you know, right on the margins very, very quickly. And one of the sweeping changes to this new farm bill is instead of receiving direct payments, producers must now sign up for one of two price loss coverage options. This is a new, you know, new path for them. It's new territory. Um, I understand that the changes in the, the farm bill and our farm programs were, um, were drastic for a lot of folks. The certainty of a direct payment, you knew what to expect, you went into our offices and you signed up and it was pretty straightforward and, and, and simple, frankly. Um, the new pro programs give choices to producers um, for the first time, so um, they're having to look at all the options. And with options now to choose from, some farmers are feeling uncertain as the deadline quickly approaches. Again, the burden is on the producer. Um, so I think folks are a little reluctant to pull the trigger. I think they're getting closer and closer. They know the deadlines are, are looming. They know they need to do this. I think they're talking to each other a little more. However, it's a decision that should not be taken lightly as it will affect your operation throughout the entire five-year farm bill. There is a default, and there will be you know, a default program if you don't make the decisions, but it's critical. We encourage producers to take this seriously. It's for the life of the Farm Bill. You really need to be thinking about your own operation. Own it, um, invest in the decision, be careful, do what's right, but for you. Reporting from Washington, D.C., I'm Damon Jones for the Georgia Farm Monitor. 
All right, Damon, thank you, sir. Well, according to the 2015 American Farm Bureau Federation's annual Young Farmers and Ranchers Outlook Survey, about one third of young farmers and ranchers ages 18 to 35 are most concerned about the availability of land to grow their crops and raise animals. AFB of Young Farmers and Ranchers Committee Chair John Hegeman says the survey also shows there is some concern about government regulations as well as whether or not their parents will be willing to turn over the farms and ranches to them and the overall profitability of their farms. And then there's the issue of financing. It's hard. As a lot of us know, starting in farming or agriculture or expanding an operation, it's a number one aspect of trying to get started obtaining financing. So especially in my situation as a young farmer, I mean, financing's been a battle since day one. Now, as far as communicating with consumers, Hegeman says many young farmers and ranchers surveyed utilize social media on a daily basis. Well, be sure to mark this date on your calendar, April 27th. That is the official shipping date for Vidalia onions this season. Now, why April 27th, you ask? Well, according to the Vidalia Onion Advisory Panel, growers chose the date based on historical and scientific data regarding maturity, this year's weather impacts, and market opportunity. The later date will also allow for more inspection to assure the quality and maturity of the onions meet marketing standards. And another Georgia company has been granted special permission for drone usage. The Atlanta Journal-Constitution reporting that Phoenix Air, which transported Ebola patients in specially equipped planes last year, was granted a two-year exemption and waiver to operate drones for use in filmmaking, patrolling, aerial inspection, and agriculture. Norcross-based Vision Services Group also received an exemption for the use of drones in agriculture and forestry. And Georgia pecans have seen their popularity rise worldwide in recent years, and as a result, the industry has seen many new growers and many new orchards planted. Yeah, recently the Monitor's Mark Wildman paid a visit to the Georgia Pecan Growers Association's <laughs> annual educational conference and trade show and has this report. In Perry, Georgia pecan producers gathered at the Georgia National Fairgrounds to learn all about the issues that affect this very popular Georgia crop. At the 50th Annual Educational Conference and Trade Show, pecan growers got to hear about a number of different topics that have a direct impact on their farming operations. I hope the uh, smaller growers can come and, you know, learn the new, it's a good opportunity to meet with larger growers and learn the new trends like hedging or the new spray programs and there's just a lot of research that everybody can grasp from this event. The industry is growing at a fast pace and growers are eager to keep up with demand. So keeping orchards healthy and thriving is always a focus. Experts gave detailed presentations about topics ranging from irrigation to disease management, and other industry experts gave presentations on exports and marketing. It is all an effort to keep Georgia pecans on the minds and plates of consumers. Georgia pecans are doing good. Um, exports are doing very well for us. We're trying uh, through the Georgia Com Georgia Pecan Commodity Commission to increase uh, domestic marketing here within the U.S. Um, China is still a very big player. I believe somewhere around 80 to 100 million pounds were exported to China this year. So it's about a third of the U.S. crop. And here domestically, we haven't even tapped here at home. And that's our main effort now to hopefully get this marketing campaign underway with the shellers and the growers and the accumulators all together and really hammer here domestically the health benefits of pecans. We're trying to get away from the pecan pie and think about the antioxidants within pecans and just the health benefits of pecans. One way the industry is looking at funding future endeavors is by establishing a marketing order. The marketing order will allow the industry to charge a certain amount per in-shell pound to fund initiatives that will grow the industry. The marketing order will allow pecans, our industry, to get in the game. Uh, we've got a great story to tell, we've got a healthy product, chefs love the diversity of pecans, and so we don't have to take a back seat to any commodity, tree nut, we've just not told our story very well. And a marketing order will provide funding uh, for our story to be told domestically uh, and internationally. The plan for a marketing order has been well received by growers. I always believe if, if we can get in front of a grower and we can exchange not only uh, describe what a marketing order is, but listen to what their needs are, we can better design uh, a program. Growers at the event also got to visit a large trade show where numerous pieces of field equipment were on display 
and they got a great opportunity to catch up with other producers. These producers are eager for the upcoming growing season and are eager to see a bright future for Georgia pecans. In Perry, I'm Mark Wildman for the Georgia Farm Monitor. All right, Mark, great job, sir. Well, coming up after the break, we get down and dirty with the Georgia gardener, Walter Reeves, who has some advice about daylilies, plus details on a pretty neat research project involving Georgia Power and Georgia Southern University. And then later, the sacrifices, time away from the family and amount of time traveling the country, all in the name of teaching young farmers about the grassroots of agriculture. The Monitor hears from Southern Bell Farms Jake Carter on the valuable lessons that he learned while serving as the National Young Farmer and Ranchers Committee Chair. Stay with us. You know, daylilies are one of the easiest plants to grow in the garden. And daylilies that one year you plant two, within three or four or five years, there might be six or seven or eight. They bloom just about all summer. But one of the problems with daylilies is once the clump has become established, it may get crowded. And then all those plants are in the same spot, competing for the same nutrients and the same water. We're here at the Sibley Horticulture Center at Callaway Gardens, and they have a clump of daylilies that needs dividing. That's what we call it when you take a clump that's gotten a little bit too big, a little bit too old, and it's competing for nutrients. We divide them and get all these plants divided out to put in other parts of our garden. So the first thing to do is use a shovel, go around the clump about two, six inches or so from the edge of the clump, and just shove it straight down into the ground, and lift gently with the handle. Oh, let's heave this thing out of the ground. Lots of plants in here. I'm just trying to put the shovel underneath it. Oh, so we can flip it out and see. We'll shake the dirt off the clump, and pretty soon you can see there are all sorts of plants in here. One, two, three, four. Oh, you can lose count. But what I'm going to try to do is to separate individual plants out of the clump. We we'll shake all this dirt off of them. I feel pretty sure we can get inside there and find some, but I can't get my fingers in. So what I'm gonna use instead is a trowel. Mm. There. To go in and open it up. There we go. There we have it. Nice plant. Got a couple of clumps of leaves on it. Do I wanna divide it again? Let me see. Yes, I do. All right, so we can divide that. There's one plant, see? And then here's another couple. Each one has leaves and roots on it, see that? Here's another one, come on. If I'm real gentle, they'll come apart really easily. You can use a knife if you need to. There's a fourth one. And I still haven't finished dividing the whole clump. Frankly, I found that a serrated steak knife that I stole out of the kitchen was the greatest tool in the world. Then my spouse found out about it and I couldn't use her steak knives anymore. There we go. Another and another. It's like buried treasure. I've got all these daylilies. Look at all this. Wow. So, oh, even more. Are you kidding me? I'm going to go into the business. So each one of these daylily plants is going to grow up and have flowers on it and beautify my landscape or my friend's landscape because I'm going to have to give away some of these, I'm sure. There we go. There we go. And that. So now let's plant two of them in the clump where there's now, what, a couple of dozen coming out of it. And all you have to do for that is take your daylily with the roots, scoop a little area out with your hands, put it back in place. Let's do this one right here. And we'll take the rest of them and give them to the Callaway staff and they can plant them in other plants or other places around the garden. So you see, that wasn't hard at all. It doesn't hurt the plant and it really helps the plant, really, to divide them up so they're not all competing for the same resources in the same spot. There are lots of other plants that can be divided easily too. Hosta, that's one you really should try to divide. It's one of those that's easy to do. Usually in the springtime is the easiest time to do it. 
So we divide our daylilies. You see how easy it is? Nothing to it. Don't forget, if you go to a local garden center, local nursery or greenhouse, they have the knowledge and the expertise to teach you how to be a better gardener. It's great to be here today. If you need more details about gardening or about the Georgia Farm Bureau, you can go to gfb.org. Well, here on the Georgia Farm Monitor, we like to go occasionally out of our comfort zone, venture out and take a look at some of the other outdoor happenings around the state. One project that is currently underway involves Georgia power and wind turbines. Across this field at Skidaway Island on Georgia's coast, Georgia Power Company planning to install four small-scale wind turbines. John Kraft, a spokesman with the power company in Atlanta, said they're joining forces with Georgia Southern University in an effort to conduct the wind research. Uh, assess the feasibility of these resources, these new turbines, and again, with an eye towards what an individual customer might want to do if they were interested. Uh, second point is to test the wind resources and assess the wind resources that we do have in Georgia across several geographic areas. And thirdly, we want to understand, better understand the characteristics of these small scale wind turbines and that would include avian impacts and um, uh, noise issues and considerations. Kraft said the demonstration project at the University of Georgia's Skidaway Institute of Oceanography will include several turbines, which he described to be small in nature. So again, this is focused for maybe a residential user or something like that. Uh, these would be about 30 meters tall, uh, whereas the, the, the large wind turbines you see would be maybe 80 to 100 meters tall. So th that's some of the differences, uh, some of the different types we're, that we'll be looking at. The Skidaway Institute, known for a great deal of research around the ocean off the coast of Georgia, it was selected after six months of site evaluation and after the Georgia Public Service Commission approved the idea of a wind demonstration project, part of the utility's 2013 Integrated Resource Plan. We were looking for a site that had met a couple of uh, uh, criteria, uh, the land available uh, in the region that we wanted to look at near the coast, um, uh, also the Research focus of Skidaway Institute is certainly a good fit as well, and access to distribution, to our distribution system. Once so, the University System of Georgia's Board of Regents approves this plan in an upcoming board meeting, Georgia Power and Georgia Southern planning to build the turbines in July and remove them in about 24 months. Well, turning now to matters on Capitol Hill. In a series of key votes, the U.S. Senate recently made it perfectly clear to the EPA that WOTUS, or Waters of the U.S. Rule, is simply unacceptable. Yeah, but the question, Kenny, is EPA listening? Probably not, according to AFBF regulatory specialist Don Parrish. All indication is that the administrator and EPA intend to ram this proposal through, regardless of the important comments that were made on it, and try to do so as quickly as possible. EPA's own contractors said 68% of them oppose the regulation. That's unprecedented. That is pretty amazing because when people bothered to look at the details of the proposal, they overwhelmingly opposed it. When we come back, the demands of being the National Young Farmers and Ranchers Committee Chairman, Jay Carter shares all with the monitor and tells us why he is extremely humbled to have served in that role. Stay with us. Well, as a fifth generation farmer, Henry County's Jay Carter has made it his personal mission to share his knowledge of agriculture with both consumers and aspiring young farmers. In fact, he was once quoted as saying, we need to put a face on farming and show people what we do, how we do it, and why. His passion for the industry, one of the many reasons why in 2014, Carter was elected the American Farm Bureau's National Young Farmers and Ranchers Committee Chair. Well, having completed his one-year term this past February, recently Jake shared with the monitor his experiences as the National Committee Chair and what it's like to once again be a full-time farmer and a full-time husband and father. For a God-fearing family man like Jay Carter, 80 days on the road, away from the family and away from the farm, was at times a tough pill to swallow. But they were sacrifices Jake was willing to make for the better good of agriculture and to educate the young up-and-coming farmers of America. Nowadays, the only road Jake is required to travel is the dirt road leading to his fields. Being here on this farm, that's 
that's home. That's where I'm comfortable. That's my comfort zone. Uh, but I, I, it was good for me this year to get, step outside my comfort zone and uh, get out there and meet new people and see new places and uh, get to do things I never thought I'd get to do. I was very proud, very humbled, um, just very excited for Jake. Just the opportunity that he was taking and um, the, the things that he was doing while he was on the road. The girls and I prayed for him every night in his safety and, and I made sure that they knew that he was doing a good thing. That it was temporary, but it was re rewarding for our family and our farm. So um, it's emotional thinking about it, but we're excited for him. We were, we were glad for all that he did for the Farm Bureau. And boy, did he do a lot. As only the third Georgia farmer ever to be elected to the position, Jake not only shared his wealth of knowledge about the ag industry, he also led by example. A dream come true, according to Carter, whose many objectives included being able to represent Georgia on a bigger scale. You know, I think uh, being in Farm Bureau, we always hear about the grassroots structure, the grassroots organization. and. Um, being in other parts of the country, it just really brought that to light to see how other uh, states, uh, how their Farm Bureaus run and how they um, react to the, the situations that are happening that are specific to them. Uh, it's really neat to learn about uh, how other Farm Bureaus work. And make no mistake about it, his knack for connecting with Farm Bureau members, another example of why many see Jake as a future leader in the organization. The personality and charisma was certainly on display during February's AFBF Fusion Conference in Nashville. This jersey used to fit a little better than this. It... I'm just going to throw that out there in case you were wondering. I look fat and out of shape I am. We've got young people saying, yes, yes, I will talk to a consumer about how my crops are grown. Put me in coach. I'm ready to play. You know, dealing with the public is something that we do here on our farm, and uh, talking to people and just interacting is something that, um, to be honest with you, I'm a shy person. Uh, when it comes down to it, I'm a, I feel like I'm a personable guy, but, uh, but really interacting with people is something that I've really um, grown to love over the years. And, um, you know, that, that night when I gave my speech, it was just a, uh, just a real humbling experience, just kind of like everything that I learned and, uh, and grew to uh, watched how other people react and just, it was just a really neat experience. We got a lot of young collegiate uh, Farm Bureau members coming through the ranks and it's so exciting to see uh, Georgia uh, stepping up and uh, getting down there at ABAC and starting that collegiate chapter. And from what I hear, they're just thrilled and excited and looking forward to that next step there. And that's one of the things that I saw um, as I traveled the country this year is, is a lot of excitement and enthusiasm from our younger uh, young farmer members. However, having fulfilled his duties as the YFNR National Chair, it's back to doing what Jake does best, and that's being a father and husband. Today I just went to donuts for dad with my little girl at her school and stuff like that. I mean, I just really uh, look forward to being here and being home and, and pray, playing the role as a, as a father and a, and a husband. Just seeing him do that and how hard of a worker he is. Some days it's frustrating um, that I never seen, but the reward that it's bringing us and that it's bringing this farm, it's, it's worth it. Yeah, and it goes without saying, big thanks to both Jake and Jennifer for letting us come out to their farm and spend some time with them, especially now that they're getting ready for strawberry season. Well, that's going to do it for this week's edition of the Georgia Farm Monitor. Well, here's a reminder for all the latest ag info regarding food, great recipes, and what's happening down on the farm. Be sure and check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest pages. You'll be informed and see what's up in the world of farming, plus the Farm Monitor Show. And you know, one of the advantages of working at the Georgia Farm Bureau Home Offices, the Yoshino cherry trees that adorn the building. Yes, now this year, they are exceptionally beautiful. As we leave you today, we thought we'd share a few of those trees with you. Hope you have a great week.